Hey there! My name is Tara C. Sinclair and I am the pattern designer behind Outlaw Creations. I want to thank you for letting me join you in your sewing room. It's a complete honor to get to hang out with you as we work together on our Bailey backpack. Now before we get started, I'd like it if you'd check over your material list and make sure you have everything you need. We are going to go through it in detail in this video, but for now just do a quick glance over it all and do a cursory check. Then, another ask, I want you to read through the whole pattern. I know it's going to read like it's in a different language, but if you read it once through, then nothing is as much of a surprise as much when we get to it in our instructions later. And then, before you watch the rest of the video, there is a pause button. I know it's there. There's a bunch of decisions that need to be made. Number one, what size are you doing? Are you doing the small or are you doing the mini? Both of these are the mini size. The small is a little bit bigger, but not much. Then number two, which front panel are you going to do? There's the plain front panel where it's just one solid fabric. There's this one, which is your hidden zipper pocket panel. And there's this one with that pop-out, ooh, my pointing tool, with this pop-out zipper pocket. Oh. I thought I was doing so well there. So there's three options for the front panel. Then number three, what size straps are you going to do? There's added adult and there are toddler straps. The toddler straps are really short. They are meant for just a little person. <clears throat> Here we can see the toddler straps. Not very big at all. Okay. And then here we have our full length strap. And that's one that'll fit a, a seven year old an average seven-year-old, and any bigger. <clears throat> I'm not saying that a six-year-old needs this one. Use your judgment call, but choose which size straps are you doing. Number four, are you going to make a backpack with two straps, or did you want to try a sling style bag? If you want to do a sling style, then check out the file download area where you downloaded the Bailey backpack pattern because in there, there's another file that's actually an add-on. It has all the instructions and it has a pattern piece for you to make this a sling bag instead of a backpack. So I'm not going to go through those instructions during the sew along, but they're there and there's all the information you need and I can answer all your questions if you have any. And then last but not least, number five, what fabric are you using? There's the hard one. If you're using something stretchy, get the woven interfacing applied before you even start cutting. If you're using a canvas, I used a, a light canvas on this one, you can skip the woven interfacing, but throughout these videos, and especially this one, I'm going to assume you're using a cotton and need to follow all of the instructions as written. So this one's all quilting cotton. But know that you can swap things up, you just may need to change your interfacings. So now, I'm going to assume you've made all those decisions and you're ready to go. The preparation phase for the Bailey backpack includes um, all of the interfacing, the cutting, the checking over you have all the materials ready to go to ensure that we can get moving on our Bailey backpack. Here I do have a mini with me. This is the mini with the covered zipper front. So you can see it's got a zipper pocket right up here to get in there. I just closed it. Let's open it. So we have a little zipper pocket there. Nice and covered for protection. There's also the pop-out 
front. I'm going to give you some instruction on that or walk you through how to do that. And there's the, the core pattern, which is just a solid front. So you can put the feature fabric on there, or you could do embroidery. You could do applique. You could take a panel and put it in anything. So we're going to get all the bits together to start working on our bailey. I'll show you where all the components are on here as we go through them. So we're going to start with that exterior fabric, so our main body print. When we're talking about this covered zipper front, the exterior does not include that. That's part of the accent. But the exterior is the full body as well as the back. And then the accent are these black pieces here and that piece. You'll see on this version I did use accent for the bottom. That's a completely your choice option. And on the pop-out front, it's all exterior fabric for that front. I am going to use this print for my exterior. It's a big print. It's going to be fun. We're then going to use this fabric as my accent. So that's going to be those bits on the back of the bag. These pieces, the strap anchors here. Okay. Then we have lining fabric. And the lining fabric is inside, I just closed it again, inside your pockets, okay. as well as inside your bag. All of this is lining fabric. And inside this zipper pocket. Oh look, I didn't close that pocket, I opened it. So all of that is the lining fabric, which I'm going to do in a solid white. I have a Michael Miller fabric that's a solid, solid white here that I'm going to use. So I've just got that solid, solid white there, which is going to go great with, with my really dark prints here. We then have fusible woven interfacing. Your fusible woven interfacing is what gives your quilting cotton um, or if you're going to use a stretchy fabric, gives your stretchy fabrics, whichever one you're going to use, a little body, a little stability, um, and keep it from stretching. So that woven interfacing feels like just a cotton fabric, like it's woven just like a, a woven quilting cotton. Okay, I have two different ones here that I'm going to show you. This one is an SF-101. When you feel the glue side of it, it's bumpy and it's rough. It's scratchy. Okay, you won't be able to see those glue dots in my video, but it does have glue speckling almost. Like it's, it's pretty solid there, but that is an SF-101. You can see it's not a thick cotton. It, you can almost see my hand. Yeah, you can kind of see my hand through that in the video. This one is another brand of an equivalent to SF-101. And I'm not sure if you can see, but it's shiny on the glue side. And it's almost like it has a sheet of glue on it instead of that rough texture. So this one is a smooth texture to it and it's shiny and that's the glue side. When you look at the fabric sides of both of these, they're almost identical. What you want to make sure is that it's a woven interfacing. That's the real key here. You want it to act like your cotton. You want it to, to pretend like it's cotton so that it doesn't wrinkle your bag. Okay, so those are two different ones. I actually don't use SF-101. I have an off-brand that I get from a local company here by the Bolt, so I use that. And it comes in, locally, it comes in a 44-inch wide um, structure. SF-101 comes in a 17-inch wide layout. That's our fusible woven interfacing. Then we are using today fusible fleece. Okay, Fusible fleece is exactly that. It is a fleece that's similar to that SF-101 has a bumpy side to it which is your glue side. Okay, 
again, there's a scratchy, dotty looking texture to it. It's not very thick, and you can see it's, it's quite soft. Um, so that's what gives us some softness without structure, like without being really, really structured. If you wanted this to be a really firm bag, you could use foam. This is a uh, non-fusible foam. You can see it's about an eighth of an inch thick. You can get those as well. But in the case of the size of this bag, I liked the fusible fleece. And by using fusible fleece, I'm, I'm keeping the, the fusible fleece in my seam allowances and my machine won't balk at that. If I use foam for some of this, then it's very possible that my machine might balk at some seams during the final construction, but that's on any project if you leave this foam in your seam allowance and it's completely dependent on your machine. So that's exterior, accent, lining, fusible woven interfacing, fusible fleece. Then we get into our purse zipper. Purse zipper versus regular zipper. Let me undo this elastic. I buy zipper by the yard. I do not use pre-cut zippers. That is a personal preference. That's it. No, no other reason. So I'm laying these two out here. My purse zipper is a number 4.5 or 5. And what that means is the zipper tape is wider than a standard zipper. So a 4.5 or 5 zipper, it's actually got teeth that are um, 4.5 millimeters or 5 millimeters wide and that's where it's it's really getting its association. Now it also means the tape is one and a quarter inches wide not one inch wide. So we are going to be taking a bigger seam allowance on this kind of zipper. When I buy zipper by the yard I do buy pulls separately so we do have two zipper pulls here that turn this into a purse zipper. Um, and what that's for is the top of our bag and I do like to have my two pulls. It makes it easier to open my bag. So we required 22 inches for the large and we need 18 inches for the mini. Small and mini. I can't even get my names right here. Okay, so I have plenty and I've got my two poles. I'll put those on later. Then I have my number three zipper, and this is a standard dress zipper that you can get at most fabric shops. Um, in this case, again, I'm using zipper by the yard, and then somewhere around here, I have a baggie with my zipper poles in it that, of course, I've already lost because that's how I roll. This one, the zipper teeth are three millimeters wide and our zipper tape is one inch wide and typically this is just re referred to as a standard zipper. So I'll be cutting off my nine inches I believe it's what I I require. I'm gonna set that aside for the moment as well and eventually find my zipper heads. Then what do we have? We have backpack strap adjusters. These funky dudes. Also, um, they may be called ladder locks. Um, they, they could be called many, many things. I'm going to be honest there. Let's take a look at what these are doing. These are, let's see if I can get this in the light, backpack strap adjusters. So let me flip this sucker around so we can see them. Never helps that I use black on black. What we're doing is this top part of our strap is going to hook on this top bar and hold it in place. Okay, That's what's going to hold our, our, our strap in place. And then this bottom strap here is going to come up around this bar, around this next bar, and come back under. So we have a right side and a wrong side to these. This is the right side. This is the wrong side. 
This one, it's a wrong side because I don't know that you can see this, but we have little teeth here. Okay, so we have little teeth here, and that's actually what's going to prevent our strap from pulling out. Okay, so we can pull it this way to tighten it, but that's what holds it tight. Okay, and then we can lift up and pull it out. So those are our backpack strap adjusters. Then the last thing I have sitting here, we have webbing or strapping. I've just got black. My bag's going to be black and white and gold. May as well stick with something I know. This is one inch wide, which means it fits in my strap adjusters. So when I do that top strap, I'll come up the top section here. We'll come down this, and that's what's going to hold the top. Then when I do the bottom, we're going to come up the middle and down over top of that bar. And that's going to hold the bottom. So we will get further into that when we get to the straps. But that's how these work. And I have lots of this webbing. I keep it on hand. I like to use it when I'm not feeling the strap making vibe. When I use this product, um, it is a polypropylene product. Um, carefully, I like to burn my ends, melt my ends, just to uh, prevent them from fraying. Yes, that's a powerful tool as opposed to just a little lighter. I'm sorry, I, I've never been able to make lighters work. So um, my husband got me this torch from Snap-on that is way more power than anybody should actually have in a sewing room, but it works for me. So those are, those are our material requirements. Those are the, the requirements we need to make this bag. Now if you have decided that you want to do the add-on for the sling strap instead of the backpack, you won't require those backpack strap sliders. Um, instead, there is a slightly different hardware requirement list in the add-on pattern that comes with your purchase. It's in your downloads area where you purchased your pattern at ocreations.com and it talks about using um, some strap sliders that are, are more, nor more used to bag making world kind of thing. So. It does go through those materials there. Now, let's talk about the next section in our pattern. We're going to take a look at these. We have our cover page, not beautiful photos. I'm not a photographer, so I'm calling them beautiful. My printer seems to be lacking in ink lately, so we're going to have to adjust that. So we've gone through our material requirements. If you are doing the covered zipper front, which is the one I showed you where it's just got that cover on the zipper here, this is our covered zipper front, you do need that additional number 4.5 zipper. Okay, so that's our bigger purse zipper again. Make sure you've got a little bit more of that. And same with the pop out zipper front. You only need these extra amounts of zipper if you're doing one of those fronts. If you're going to do a solid front on your bag, you don't need those. Going to pop over to the information section of our pattern. Quickly, seam allowances are 3 8 of an inch in this pattern, unless otherwise stated. We are back stitching at the start and end of our seams. Top stitching, I like to use a 3.5 millimeter or a 4.0 millimeter. So that's a 3.5 or 4 setting on my sewing machine. Every machine is slightly different, so find the happy place for you. I do like a slightly larger stitch length, not a super small one. We do some basting in this, and that's done with a larger stitch length. So again, a 4, it's just fine. My machine goes up to a 5, so I like to use that 5 for basting. And the entire pattern instructions are here for the small and the mini. The mini is just identified in some colors. Okay, So we've got everything we need in this pattern to make 
three different versions of the small or the mini backpack. Printing. This can be a challenge. Not every one of us is super comfortable with computers. Um, so I do give you some guidance here. When you print your pattern, make sure you're using the latest version of Adobe Acrobat or Adobe Reader. Don't print it from your Google Chrome browser. Download the file to your computer, open the file in Adobe, and then print it from there. Make sure that you print at 100% or actual size. That's so important, so important. I can't stress that enough. So if you've had an update to your Adobe program, double check that you are using 100% um, or actual size because Adobe likes to mess with you and they will change your settings on you during those updates. When I print my patterns, I like to print them so that they are on a, a heavier paper at cardstock almost. And that just gives me a bigger edge to uh, work with when I'm cutting my pattern pieces out. You'll also find every single page of your pattern has a one inch square. I do that on purpose because if I print without checking that one inch square or making sure that scaling is at 100 or that it's actual size, that one inch square could be off on one or two pages, but accurate on others. So we're going to check that one inch square, use a ruler, make sure it's right on every page. Every page! Mm. Let's bring that pattern piece back. If you're making the main size, not the small, the, sorry, if you're making the small size, not the mini, you're going to see a pattern piece that has this, this, this A with a star, there's another pattern piece that lines up here. Find that. It's important. This is the other half of that pattern piece. You're going to put those pieces together to make your full piece. Okay. The mini, you don't need to tape any pieces together. They, uh, they use less than a pattern uh, page. But another tip is because we have this place on fold section on our pattern pieces, you could print two of this piece and tape them together to make a full pattern piece so you don't have to cut on the fold. All right, I've totally flown through a whole bunch of information there. All our materials, the printing information. I know you can slow this video down and watch it again. <laughs> um, these are pieces of information that are relevant to every one of my patterns. Um, always, always take a look at the information section in my pattern. It gives you that seam allowance. It tells you about top stitching. It tells you how to follow the instructions if there are multiple sizes. Super important. And definitely check those printing instructions on every pattern you ever, ever buy. Some of them are like mine where you cut your pattern pieces out and then you tape them together. And some of them, you actually trim the edges of the page and tape those full pages together before you cut your pattern pieces out. So then we get into cutting. I'm going to bring my pattern pages back here. There's a lot of cutting instructions going on here. We have pattern pieces that tell us what to cut. So here, I'm going to show you how this is laid out. On the main pattern piece here, we're going to cut two exterior fabrics, two lining, four woven interfacing, two fusible fleece. However, notice our asterisks here. Refer to the cutting list if you're making any of the optional pocket fronts. You don't need two exterior and four woven interfacings if you're doing either of the optional pocket fronts. So this is why it's so important to understand our cutting instructions. So when there is, I'm going to bring this here, as we go through our cutting list here, if we have a pattern piece, you're not going to have a measurement next to it. If you have no pattern piece, you're going to have a measurement next to it. 
this is for the entire cutting list. You don't have pattern pieces for all your rectangles and squares. Um, I like to use a rotary cutter and a ruler to do that kind of cutting. Slap it down, do my measurements, cut along the edge. Not everybody's comfortable with that. Um, so some people like to trace their lines before they cut them with scissors. Uh, everybody's slightly different. However, for your full pattern, you do need to go through the cutting list here, which is across two pages, noting any items such as the main, review for the, for the front option sections, because on the second page you have your front option details. So if you're replacing one of the main exteriors, you do need to follow these cutting instructions as well. We have the instructions for the covered zipper front, which is this one that I've shown you, and we have the pop-out zipper front. Okay, And then in each of these, I also break it down to how many pieces you need for the exterior, how many you need for the accent, the lining, interfacing, and fleece. So let's get started. I'm going to show you how I do this. This is not by uh, any means the only way of doing it. Let's take this guy away. And I'm actually going to start with my fusible fleece because there's fewer pieces of it than there are anything else. Now, as I said, I'm a rotary cutting girl. I do like to use my rotary cutter instead of Instead of uh, scissors, I swear I failed kindergarten, scissors are not my friend. So, fusible fleece. I know I need two main pieces regardless of what front I'm making. I also need two straps, either adult or child straps. I'm going to grab my big ruler here. And I'm going to start with the strap pieces because they're long straight edges and that means I can use my full width of fabric. So I'm going to cut some adult straps. I'm just finding the width that I need and I'm going to cut a long strip of that and then I'm going to sub cut that into smaller pieces for each strap. So, Where'd my rotary cutter go? Right here. Here we go. Rotary cutter. Keep your hands on the ruler away from your cutting space. Super important when rotary cutting. Okay. And safety on whenever possible. Keep your safety on. I have a dog that, that, that's right here. Like right, right here. If I drop that rotary cutter, I could be cutting him. So it's not even just about my safety. It's about his safety. Now I'm also going to make these adult straps, so I'm going to use the measurements for the adult straps here and cut my length. There's one, and there is two. Don't tell my husband I just dropped stuff off the back of my table. Strap fleeces. Now, something some people like to do is make themselves up a set of labels so they uh, they can then start labeling things. I happen to have some Emmeline bag sticky notes here. And I'm just going to call this strap because I'm going to have an couple of outer pieces for this as well and I'll be honest I just tear that and it's fleece pins never gonna hurt anything so cut and labeled that means I'm coming back to my cut list done next the other thing I like to do is if I'm making one size and there's two sizes listed, if I'm gonna make the small, I'm gonna scratch out the mini so I don't confuse myself, 
Okay, so there's an option there too. Um, also, I'll I'll sit here, and if I'm going to mix up my exterior and accent, I'll say main. We're going to do that as the big print strap support. I'm actually going to use the big print there. I'll I'll mark this up like there's no tomorrow. I actually print these instructions individually each time I go to make my bag, or read them from the computer screen. So I'll be honest, I read them from the computer screen more often. So strap, please, setting it aside. What else do I need from fleece? I need my mains and I need my zip gusset and my gusset base. So I'm going to pop through and do those ones up. Okay, we're now cutting a pattern piece. I'm going to take my main. We're going to lay this out. And when it comes to my, my stabilizers or my, my interfacings, I generally don't worry too much about being perfect because I, it's my fabric I want to be right and it's my fabric that I'm going to follow the sew, sewing lines on. So, I am going to cut this on the fold through the two layers. When it's on the bolt, it's a little more difficult to do this. And because of the fluffiness of this material, that fold is going to be a little bit bigger than I, I necessarily need, but it's going to work. And I can trim this down later if I need to. So we're going to do that. I like to use my ruler to hold this in place and to get some of those straight lines. Just shifted. Watch that shifting with your rotary cutting. Please do what I say, don't do what I do. I am not the safest rotary cutter. And then at the top, I'm going to do the same thing. Again, I like to use my, my ruler just to hold things in place. can be done easier if you do it in one layer, not two. So here, we have all the fleece bits. Just gonna take my cutting list and double check that. I have two mains, I have my two straps, I have my zip, two zip gussets, and I have my gusset base. Ready to go for the next set. Let's head to fabrics. Here we're going to cut the 
main exterior. Because I'm going to be doing one of the pockets, I only need one of the main, and then I'm going to cut the extra pieces for the pocket. So let's unpin this and get going. Now, when, uh, here's another do what I say, not what I do. When I go to cut fabric, I do like to ensure it's pressed so it doesn't have any extra creases in it. Because those folds or those, those creases can cause difficulty. So it, this fabric gives me a little bit of a Harry Potter feel to it, but it's actually de um, designed by Libs Elliott, one of my favorite designers. And this is going to be a main back piece. And it's not a particularly large piece, but I also know that I'm going to have, when I take this, I'm going to have my strap piece coming across here. So I'm, <laughs> here's where my pickiness comes in. I'm going to want to keep the lettering either right in that area or have full lettering coming across it here. So maybe cutting it directly across here would be perfect for me. So we're going to unfold this. Because I only need one of it. I'm going to bring it up this way so I can see it better. Now I had a gold letter there. We're going to make sure that this is folded straight. I'm putting my pattern piece on there so that I've got the fold against the fold edge. Yeah, fold it a little bit more here. And I can see those letters are coming right in here in the body of this. And I know that I've got enough fabric there, so I can shift it up just a little bit here. All right, we're going to cut that out. So again, I like to use my rulers to, to hold everything in place. Some people like to use pins to hold their pattern pieces in place. Some people like pattern weights. This is your call. I'm not going to tell you how to cut your fabric. Other people, they want to trace this out and then cut it with scissors. Your call. I'm going to flip over to a smaller rotary cutter for that fine corner. Bear with me as I track that down. I know it's on my rack here somewhere. All the way back here. There we go. This is my little guy. I believe this is a 28 millimeter rotary cutter instead of my usual 45. There we go. So that will be my back main. And we're going to have that band coming across here and then we'll have the strap anchors sticking out and the straps will come up and I'll have this beautiful section here with that gold focused. Okay, I'm also going to trim some fabric off of this so it's not hanging out of my sewing stash. All right, how am I planning on cutting my gusset? And I'm probably going to cut them this way. So my zipper as well as my base. I'll probably cut fully this way, I think. So now that I folded that up nice. <laughs> Let's do it this way. 
Now each of these pieces are also calling for interfacing on them. There is only one piece, I believe, that doesn't call for woven interfacing on it. And that's your zipper facing. The zipper facing is actually used to make your little turning hole that we put our zipper in behind during our zipper pocket on our lining. So another option before you start cutting your fabric out is actually to fuse your interfacing to all of it first, your woven interfacing. That's what I've actually done over here with my, my lining fabric. Because my lining fabric all requires interfacing, I've already fused it to the interfacing, and then when I cut out my pattern pieces from it, they're already cut and fused. It saves me from cutting the separate interfacing. Now because this is a feature fabric that I'm using on the exterior, and I might use this fabric again for lining later or something like that, I'm not going to fuse it all, but that is an option to save you some time and effort. So I need zip gusset and gusset base on this. All right, so we're going to set those with our fleece pieces. So here I have that main. We'll add the main to that. Here we have is the zip gusset. And these are my zip gusset bits. We'll put those together. And this must be my gusset base. And again, we'll come back to our, our cut list and mark those off as my exterior. So we have an exterior main. I don't need more of those. Gusset, gusset base. All right. So I'm going to keep going for the front options I'm going to make as well. And then I'm also going to do all my lining bits and my accents. And then we're going to come back and talk about fusing our pieces together for interfacing. Let's work through those preparation steps. I know that I've called this whole thing preparation, but let's work through those actual preparation steps of fusing things. So I'm going to bring a couple of pieces up here and we're going to work our way through those. We have the main that's going to be the back of my bag. We have the woven interfacing and we have a piece of fusible fleece for it. You at the end of your preparation steps if our, you're doing one of the zipper pockets, we'll have an extra main fusible fleece left over because we'll apply that during the construction process. Okay, so any of the pieces that have just fusible interfacing, woven interfacing, and fabric, um, this is the process I go through. I make sure that this fabric is pressed really well before I touch the woven interfacing. So I'll make sure that all of my creases are out of that. And if that means using a little bit of um, water or some steam or something, I'll do that. 
Here I've got a little mister bottle. Okay. Give it a good press. I just don't want any of those creases on the fabric to become perma creases once I've fused it to interfacing. Okay. Now, I lay my fusible woven interfacing glue side up. Okay, smooth it out, make it nice, lay this right side up on top. Yes, that means that if you have fusible interfacing showing, you could get glue on your iron. You can use a, a pressing cloth over top of this. Um, I'm going to fuse my interfacing in place, and if I get fusible glue on my iron, then I will use a dryer sheet while my iron is still hot to take that off. It seems to work really well for me. So do take a look at the instructions for your fusible interfacing. Some fusible woven interfacings require steam. Some say no steam is required. Some say you need to leave your iron in one place for 10 seconds at a time. Some require super high temperature, some don't. Every in brand of interfacing will be different. Once you've fused that, it should give your, your fabric body. It is recommended by almost every manufacturer instruction to leave your piece sit and let it cool completely. When they say that, they actually mean like a 30 minute full cool down. I'm not that patient. Plus, I'm about to heat this up again because this piece has fusible fleece to go with it. Now, fusible fleece. So we're going to fuse our woven interfacing to all of our fabric pieces. And then those that need fusible fleece, we're going to follow a similar process. In this case, my glue is right side up. Double check that because if you fuse this to your ironing board, you're gonna have to peel that off and then find a way to get the glue off of that. So right side up, fabric piece right side up glue against the back and then we're going to press this. Now in my case my woven interface doesn't need a super high temperature or long periods of time to fuse it but that means I need to spend a little more time with my fusible fleece because it does need more fusing effort than my woven. Now I've also found using a little bit of water to, to help steam this, adds that extra heat to melt that glue so it adheres better. You'll notice I'm still on the one side. I haven't even moved to the other yet. I'm just making sure that this side is fully fused. Then the top, spend some time. I'll work my way down. Enjoy the process. Turn some music on. Sing some songs. Now something to be aware of is your fusible fleece may cause waves in your fabric. Don't panic yet. That's normal. I've, I've experienced a lot of that with fusible fleece. Here I see I'm getting a little bit of a wave or a, a bubble in it. Sometimes, I'm just making sure that feels fused all the way around. I'm not peeling it up because the glue is still soft, so I'm not peeling it up. But I can feel I've got a little bit of a bubble here. And if this starts to, to get wavy, it could be because my fleece has shrunk a little bit because it is made with a different material than your cotton. So turn your iron down to say a medium temperature instead of a high temperature. And go again and just press out those sections that are bubbling. Sometimes, we have too much, too much uh, heat going on with our fusible fleece, even though we needed that heat to get the glue to adhere. Now we use a lighter heat just to smooth it out. And I can see now that's perfectly smoothed. No more bubbling, nothing. Okay. So for any of your pieces that require fusible fleece and woven interfacing, that's what we're going to do. We're going to fuse the woven interfacing to the fabric, then the fusible fleece to the woven interfacing. 
do not press from the fusible fleece side. Um, this is a poly product and can melt. It has melted to my iron before. It was not a good experience. So I'm just going to set that over there and I'm going to do my zip gussets in the exact same process. We're going to start with our woven interfacing. Getting fused to it. But I can see I've got some pretty major creasing going on here and these really need a good press before I apply any interfacing to them at all. So make sure I've got those creases out. All those folds from sitting on my shelf. Now also be aware that your iron could get too hot for your fabric type. So be aware of the pressing instructions for your fabric type. If you are using a polyester blend fabric or something like that, you may need to use a lower temperature. Um, get to know your iron really, really well. Um, mine, I know that if I am not careful, it will scorch my cotton fabrics. So I'm very conscious of it. Here I'm just doing both pieces at one time. If you have a heat press, I hear that that is an amazing investment. I just don't have a space in my sewing room to put one and keep it sitting there. So I don't have one in my space. And one other tip with your interfacing or fusible fleece, instead of cutting it perfectly, you can cut it just a touch smaller than your fabric pieces. It's all about your fabric being accurate, but if you cut your fusible fleece a quarter inch skinnier, then that really leaves a little more space for centering it on the fabric, or centering the fabric on it. Okay, there's one. There's two. Another idea for these zip gussets, or even your straps, is you could cut this as one wide piece, adhere the fusible inter woven interfacing and the fusible fleece, then cut it in half. Almost like you're doing some bulk cutting and then sub cutting. Just an option. It's something I do actually uh, myself a lot when I'm really comfortable with a pattern. Don't burn yourself. Keep your hands away from the iron surface. Again, just check and make sure that that's fused in place. If it starts pulling up, then go back and press it again. And I think I'm good. So I'm going to continue doing the rest of my, my pieces. Put the zip gusset label back on. All right, we have done a whole whack load of cutting, fusing, preparing, labeling, a lot of pieces here. So we've technically done step one and two of all the preparation by getting all of that interfacing and all of that fleece fused to our pieces. And we're on step three of that preparation where we're going to mark some centers. Um, so let's start with the list. The exterior and lining mains, those are these ones at the bottom, labeled main. Looks like I forgot to cut those lining ones. Gonna have to go back. What I'm going to do to, to do this marking is I find that it's more accurate if I fold it in half. And on that fold, this is the bottom of it, we're just gonna take a little teeny tiny snip. 
Now, we read our pattern and it says that there's a 3 8 seam allowance. So by keeping that snip only about an eighth of an inch in there, what it does is it gives me a little triangle in there. And we're going to do that for the top as well. And that gives me center markings that will never go away. go. Make sure you do get that fleece out of there as well. Make sure that it's complete. Apparently I'll have to go back and cut some lining mains and prep those ones. Okay. So those can sit up there. Next we have our, let me read the right instructions, lining mains exterior and lining zip gussets. So our zip gussets, those are straps. Zip gussets are long pieces. There's zip gussets. Okay, so on a long piece like this, very similar. What I do is I fold it in half so the outer fabric is on the outside, so the right side out. I do like to fold things in half to get my my actual center and you'll find I'll do that throughout sewing when I sew my gusset together I'll do that fold in half again to to find the center once it's sewn because that's not always the same as before it's sewn so we do uh, follow through on a lot of that but once I cut those extra main pieces out of my white fabric we we'll be ready to start our next session. So let's uh, get everything prepared, prepared. Let's try that in a proper pronunciation, prepared. And you'll see me back here for some sewing, but don't forget to ask any questions. Um, toss me your pref preferred way of cutting, whether that's a rotary cutter or a scissors. You'll notice I barely touch these things. I, I really just, they're very pretty, <laughs> they cut beautifully, but I honestly am a rotary cutter girl. I did learn to sew from quilting, so that's why the rotary cutters and rulers really come into play on my side. But I will see you back for our next phase of instructions.